Thank you. Welcome to the Procurement and Contract Management webinar series brought to you on behalf of the Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Family, Children's Bureau, and presented by ICF International. Our regular moderator, Joyce Rose, could not be with us today. I am Elizabeth Martinko. I'm with ICF International, and I will be stepping in to moderate today's session. Changes in funding availability and priority mean that opportunities for in-person discussions and networking among professionals working on agency child welfare IT systems are limited. As an alternative, the Division of State Systems within the Children's Bureau is offering a series of webinars supporting information sharing and discussion. The content of the webinars is structured to appeal to a wide audience participating in an agency's child welfare IT initiatives, including state and tribal child welfare staff. As I mentioned previously, today's webinar in the Procurement and Contract Management series is entitled Contract Negotiation and Management, which I think you'll find unique and interesting as our guest presenters have a wealth of experience from both a vendor and a state perspective. Our, typic, our usual moderator, Joyce, had worked with Cynthia and with Dawn in the past on a child welfare IT project, so she knew them quite well, and that's how they came to be our speakers for today. Our remaining topics this year are CWIS Mobile Technologies in August and the SACWIS Modernization Projects in September. Attendees are encouraged to participate in our webinar with questions and comments. All of our participant lines are muted right now, but we will open them for the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. However, please be aware that you can submit questions at any time using the GoToWebinar chat feature, and those will be addressed during the Q&A session. Should we run out of time, we will respond to your questions via email at the address shown, or if you have any additional questions, you can submit those at the end of the presentation. We're very interested in knowing who is attending today's webinar. It's our intent throughout all of the webinars to make the content applicable and attractive for everyone participating in an agency CWIS efforts. We ask that you self-select one of the categories listed, and I'll go ahead and open up the poll so that our participants can do that. If you could go ahead and self-identify into one of these categories, and I'll give you just another minute to do that. Okay, we have about 86% of our audience, oh, 90%, that has gone ahead and cast their vote. So let me go ahead and share the results of the poll with you. It looks like we have 37% uh, state child welfare information systems managers, 32% um, state child welfare information systems program policy or technical staff, we don't have any tribal child welfare project managers today, but we do have 16% of our audience tribal welfare, child welfare information system program policy or technical staff, and 16% ACF Children's Bureau personnel. So welcome to you all, and thanks for joining us on today's webinar. The format of today's webinar is intro the introduction of participants, followed by approximately 60 minutes of presentation by our guest presenters. We'll end with an attendee question and answer session and follow with a short wrap-up. Remember that you can submit questions through the chat feature throughout the presentation, but there will be an opportunity to ask questions live at the end of the presentation. I'm extremely pleased to welcome Cynthia Hunt and Don Tatman as today's presenters. Cynthia Hunt is currently the principal of CLH and Associates Consulting Organization, a small Ohio-based consulting firm specializing in government and nonprofits on the program side of HHSIT. She was formerly a senior vice president for CGI and was the deputy general manager for state and local. She has more than 30 years experience managing information technology systems projects in more than 15 states across the human services programs of child welfare, child care, child support, and welfare reform. She has deep experience in contract negotiation and management as a vendor and as an advisor to state governments. Don Tatman is currently the Chief Information Officer with the Washington State Department of Enterprise Services and has over 30 years of experience man managing information technology systems. Her expertise is transforming outdated systems into state-of-the-art models that reduce operating costs and boost overall efficiencies.
She most recently served as the Technology Director for the Children's Administration of Washington, where she successfully managed the replacement of the administration's child welfare case management system. Dawn previously served as the Vice President of American Management Systems, now CGI, where she was responsible for negotiating and managing contracts, as well as implementing child welfare information systems in eight states. We are so pleased to have these experienced and qualified individuals as our guest presenters. As I mentioned, I'm Elizabeth Martinko. I am with ICF International, and I am here today to stand in for Joyce Rose, who could not join us. As I mentioned earlier, Joyce, when she worked in the state of Wisconsin, was the Child Welfare Project Manager, and Dawn and Cynthia were executives on projects with her. So the three of them had a great deal of um, experience to bring to planning this presentation, and at this point I'm going to turn it over to Cynthia to begin today's discussion. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here to speak with you about uh, contract negotiation and management. Objectives today, can you back up one, Elizabeth? I'm sorry. Yes, I can. Objectives, thank you. Objectives today are really trying, we've tried to provide a comprehensive look at the challenges. We want to make sure that you understand the perspective from the vendor's point of view. We've thought we are going to spend a little time on the art and importance of developing a contract negotiation strategy, including identifying the objectives and how they may be used to more effectively negotiate the contract, and then best practices, skills, and tools that you need uh, to successfully engage. Next slide, Elizabeth, if you would. So classically, there are lots of people involved, and it takes a lot of energy and time to be effective in negotiations. Next slide, Elizabeth. Thank you. So we want to focus on the topics that I've described. And our thinking is that the great majority of this content is useful for all types of contracts. And we're going to talk about um, several different types. We're primarily going to focus on the classic DDI for full system or large scale enhancement projects. But most of the, the lessons and or strategies and tips that we will offer you today can, can be utilized across other types of contracts as well. And we would include in that both the staff augmentation for both the business or the technical side. And when I say business here, I mean the program or child welfare HHS side for technology upgrades and also for outsourcing. Dawn and I have worked together for a long time. I'm really sorry that Joyce couldn't join us today because Dawn and I will have more stories and Joyce would be adding even more. But hopefully we can be sufficiently entertaining as well as instructive for you as we move through this material. Next slide, Elizabeth, if you would. OK, timing. Um, we realized as we talked about negotiations that we really had uh, different models that we wanted to talk about. And the model that the three of us used very effectively in the Wisconsin SAC with Steel is what we're calling Model 1, which is one that we strongly prefer for large-scale DDI deals and, frankly, large-scale deals in general. Typically, in this model, you're doing vendor selection as your first major stage. And our assumption is you're going to have one, but you might have more, and then negotiations, and then the final contract signing. And by that, we're going to go into more detail about that today, but by that, within the negotiations, you take that time to really explore and understand all points of view uh, related to the scope of the work, document the results from that, and then move on to an actual final contract signing. In most cases, or in many cases, Model 2 is the model that is dealt with when you're doing a vendor selection and then you're going straight to contract signing, assuming that all questions or issues have been resolved as part of the BAPO process or Q&A process before you select a vendor. And then you're doing negotiations throughout the project, both hard and soft negotiations. We strongly prefer the first model because it really helps bind the teams together and get issues resolved. The third model, which we want to introduce to you today, is what we're calling an in-flight or evolving model. And this is a model that has been used successfully in multiple states. It's not a classic, typically, DDI. It's more often used for enhancement projects or projects where the scope or path is evolving. And that's something that we have used in a bunch of the deals that I've been involved in called an interval deliverable attachment or quarterly deliverable attachment or a QDA or IDA model. Basically, that's a model where you don't know sort of what your final product is. not one big SACWIS system at the end, but it might be major enhancements related to legislative changes or other changes. But you might not know them all at the beginning of the project. 
And, and in this model, on a quarterly basis, you're specifying at the beginning of the quarter or the end of the prior quarter all the deliverables that you want to have happen over the course of that period and associated dollar amounts with those and defining the scope in that way and then having your vendor actually uh, create uh, deliverables and, and work to those to those deliverable schedules with the IDA and then reset for the next quarter. And that's proved incredibly effective because you're deliverable based, you're still fixed price for that quarter and you can make it be fixed price overall, but you can also evolve to the realities of the contract that you're working in. Next slide, please. I'm sure you guys have heard this, but know that the def our definition of success is balance. And if you walk away with each side being a little happy and a little unhappy, you have probably done the best job that you possibly could. If you are able to use um, your negotiations in an effective way, you also walk away where everyone is prepared to begin to work with a real understanding of the scope and also know that each side's responsibilities are congruent. I'm sure many of you have worked on projects where um, you had to go straight to contract or you haven't been able to take the time to really explain and understand the scope down to a fairly granular level uh, and dealt with the issues associated with that through either change orders or um, escalated to more uh, difficult uh, outcomes. Also, if you're able to, to do the negotiations effectively, you're able to forge relationships in a positive way. And optimally, some of the challenges, you face challenges and work successfully with those challenges, and you've got a pattern of how to work together in an effective way that can serve you in good stead throughout the project. That's how we define success. Everybody a little happy, everybody a little, a little unhappy. Next slide, please, Elizabeth. So our gold standard is that the teams meet to negotiate. You have key players physically in a room for intense time, which is typically one to two weeks for a full-scale SACWIS. You're reviewing the contract and, and potentially the RFP in great detail, including all those implicit assumptions that are embedded in your mind, uh, both as the writer of the proposal and the writer of the RFP. You discuss those assumptions, answer questions, resolve the issues real time with the goal to ensure that everybody walks away with a congruent understanding of the scope of the work. So that's our gold standard. Now, Dawn has taken that standard and moved it into new models that she's using in Washington State that we also wish to discuss with you now. Hi, um, this is Dawn Tatman, and I, as Cynthia, am very happy to be joining in this webinar for contract negotiation and management. Um, as Elizabeth said before, I am no longer in the child welfare arena. However, I was for a number of years, and um, my experiences with child welfare and being on the uh, private side with the vendor and now with the in-state government um, has provided me with a, a unique perspective that I'm hoping to share with you and as Cynthia has that same level of experience. So with my um, experience being on the vendor side and then coming into state government, we took an approach here in Washington on large-scale deals um, of a structured procurement process that we broke down into four stages. And as you can see by this slide, there's um, stage one is really getting to a minimum mission critical stage of requirements that you're going to review. And then requirements review and interview and issue list in stage two, which I'll get into in more detail. And then in stage three, which is if people make it past stage one, then make it past stage two, they would come to stage three for um, demonstrations and then a second set of interviews. And then at that point, if they make it past stage three, you would move into stage four, which in all cases that I've used this structure of procurement process, I've had at least two vendors move to that stage four so that you have options and opportunities um, to, to work forward with a couple of vendors that have met it, made it through all the three previous stages. Let's go to the next slide, Elizabeth. This is the process that supports that four-stage um, process that, or strategy that I just talked about, with stage one being an evaluation of minimum qualification and mission-critical requirements. 
And this is, was really a bit hard for some folks to try to get to. What is that? Let's be minimal on what our mission critical requirements are, but let's, let's be very specific. So this isn't necessarily your mandatory requirements that you would think about in functional and technical. This is really um, taking it up a, a higher level um, to say that they meet your security process uh, policies, your um, architectural, um, just whatever you may deem is that important. And then the evaluation and review of remaining prime bidder requirements to get through that stage two. And the stage two is where you really have a group and a team go through all of those requirements that they have responded to from a functional perspective that are mandatory or desirable, and then the technical requirements. And then the other part of stage two is a review of issues list and price proposal. And I'll get into the review of the issues list a little bit more, but the structure of these documents that come in with the um, RFP are a bit different um, than maybe you have done previously, and I'll walk through that. And then the other part of stage two is oral interviews where the vendor would come in with their senior executive folks along with the project staff, and you would conduct interviews along with reviewing the issues that they put forth in their proposal. Um, and then if they make it past that stage, we would definitely go to product demonstrations, and then from there to stage four. So let's go to the next model so I can talk a little bit about um, the next slide. There. So, the RFP includes for the vendors to respond to a umbrella contract. And so um, I've been part of a lot of negotiations, a lot of proposals, a lot of RFPs where the vendor would submit their contract and then you really don't get to dealing with a lot of those hard contract issues until you're at the end of contract negotiations. And so what this approach is trying to do is, is not have those hard contract discussions at the end. Let's have those at the beginning. And so the intent of this is for us to provide in our RFP our contract from the state. And the issue list that I had talked about earlier is that when a vendor would propose, if they had any issues with the contract or anything within that RFP, they could document those issues and then we would discuss those in the stage two to see if we could come to resolution at that point or not. And if we couldn't come to resolution at that point, then they would not move on to stage three. The other um, part of the RFP would be a technology agreement, which is an overarching agreement with the vendor based for future and projects, if any. So this is really the more detailed level of the contract, so it's overarching, and you could do future deals off of this technology agreement. And in the project agreement, there is a draft in the RFP of terms specific to the current project, along with a statement of work, and then detailed requirements for the project plan and joint resource plan. Go to the next slide. So um, continuing on with those strategies, um, one of the things that we found to be successful in using this model also is that the state manages all elements of the procurement process, including maintaining document revision control. Um, in a lot of situations, in most that I've been in the past, the, the vendor tends to do that. And um, we have found with us maintaining that document revision control, it definitely um, puts us in a better position <clears throat> to understand where we are Along with, if you are negotiating with two different vendors, it is really important that you're managing um, the revision because it can get very confusing if you have negotiations going on with two vendors. Um, this approach also requires empowered negotiators from the bidders to enable meaningful negotiations. And I, I say that, and it really is on both sides into moving into this type of a model is that you need people at the table that really can make the decisions and are empowered to do that um, so that you're not um, spending a lot of spin time and people have to get back to other people. So both on the um, vendor side and the state side, this is very key. So that really is kind of the four-stage evaluation and procurement um, process.
And moving on to the next topic, our perspective is that, based on both of us being on both sides of the fence, is that your ability to understand the vendor's perspective will help you negotiate more effectively, period. You can see from the from the write-up here, it's really, it makes Don's point about revision control in spades. Um, and it's just, it's one of the 50 uh, cartoons on Dilbert, if should you ever need this, about how effective negotiations can go wrong. Next slide, please, Elizabeth. So thinking about the world from the vendor's perspective, know that your vendors, and I think most of you probably know this, have invested significantly to prepare the RFP. Sometimes, um, I would imagine in the SACWIS area, we're talking uh, several hundred thousand dollars. And the enterprise deal that Don is talking about, it could be millions of dollars to get to the stage that they have submitted this proposal to you guys. It's important that you understand by vendor, what is their primary business? How do they make money, and what is their motivation? And I find that when I'm advising state governments as an insider, I do, I do high-level stack augmentation, often on the business side, as I've described. I'm always trying to help my clients understand the vendor's motivation. So for a classic design development implementation view, which is typically custom systems or developing customized work on a platform, Right, the profit. There's some profit on the build and implementation that the vendor's done a very effective job of writing the proposal for you and has included, as you guys all know, a lot of assumptions that are limiting in terms of what they are promising to deliver for the money. There classically is more profit on change orders and more revenue stream from ongoing enhancement and maintenance. So typically, a vendor is looking to. Um, do a little better than break even coming in and doing the initial activity, but they're making their money on the downstream. So their sense of the risk for you guys is for your particular environment is embedded in their pricing. Typically, it's a it's a percentage lift over and above what they think the project will cost that helps them um, navigate, if you will, changes in requirements from from the state side and also. You know, just general changes in their assumptions that they might not have, that might not have been valid. So, when you're thinking about a DDI vendor, know that you have more negotiation capability, uh, or you have a fair amount of negotiation capability on some of the upfront stuff, assuming that you have a vendor that's behaving rationally. Not always the case, but that they that they will probably try to. They're looking for a long-term relationship with you, and sometimes you can trade off the sense of the long-term relationship and and spread the profit for them, if you will, over the course of the full implementation and downstream activities rather than trying to make it all, trying to have it all happen up front. So that's the way to use that information, one way to use that information. If you're talking about a software product or platform, the profit can be in the software sale if there's a license fee, but often in the SACWIS market, um, historically vendors have discounted the product um, cost to zero. And more typically, downstream license and maintenance fees. Again, the downstream stuff is when you're paying regular revenue over a period of time. Once states tend to be in with a vendor or in with a product or platform, there's a significant cost to go to another product or platform. So vendors know that and try to price so that they can get in the door and then make their money on the downstream, as you know. And then for an outsourcing vendor, and actually this is a very interesting topic that most of my clients have not classically understood, the profit typically comes from making the cost of the service as inexpensive as possible, doing just enough to keep the client happy enough and ensure downstream revenue so that they don't get, they get re-upped when the RFP goes back out and they don't get thrown out. So I actually had one outsourcing vendor um, tell one of my clients that their job, they were not looking for good quality customer service. They were looking for adequate customer service, enough to essentially stay out of the paper and keep the contract over the long term. And when you think about it that way, you know, asking an outsourcing vendor, for example, to do enhancements to an existing product or asking them to do custom work um, is generally something that they're not interested in because they're always trying to be, to provide the transaction level service as inexpensively as possible. Next slide, Elizabeth, if you would. The second major part from a vendor context point of view is really understanding the prior history of the vendor within your organization and any other environments that you have access to, aka other states or experience with other states. And I think most states 
try to to do this kind of outreach on a regular basis. But it's one of the reasons to go to the national conferences or the regional conferences and also to get uh, to understand your Fed um, or to know your Fed well so, so that you can get data on vendor performance in other environments. And I recognize that most of you can't use that performance in terms of your evaluation, but you can use it in terms of your negotiations. Um, you want to understand the strengths of the vendor, and every vendor has strengths, and you need to understand those. You know, some vendors are known for giving till it hurts to make a client happy. Other vendors are known for um, having many, many change orders. Um, you know, because they've written such tight proposals that they, and having so many assumptions that they ha have figured out how to get to that downstream revenue stream of enhancements. But every vendor has strengths, and it's useful to understand those going in, as well as what are the challenges. And knowing that, you, when you sit down to do your negotiation strategy, understanding where the vendor makes their profit, and also what you can build into negotiations and or contract or project expectations that will mitigate the challenges and take advantage of the strengths is really key. So examples, if a vendor is known for many change orders and high rates, and when I talked to Don and Elizabeth and Joyce about this, everyone giggled because they, um, I'm sure they all, people all centered on a couple of vendors in, in the market. Um, and I know you guys have probably seen many of these situations as well. From a mitigation standpoint, there are multiple points of mitigation. You want to specify the downstream rates and, and experience levels. You want to include the rate of increase for those rates, which can be zero if you choose. You want to identify issues with requirements or project expectations. During negotiations, and when we talked about the gold standard where you're actually walking through the scope of work in a very detailed fashion to understand those embedded assumptions and make sure that you are aligned with the vendor, um, getting those on the table and documenting resolutions within the negotiations um, are critical as well as on the project. So um, this is your documentation to protect yourself from the revenue expansion downstream that's outside of what your plans include. Also, vendors are known for switching staff. Some of the vendors are known for switching staff or having staff on multiple engagements. And I think you guys are probably all doing key staff clauses with associated financial impacts to the vendor, including um, specification of who's full-time, who's part-time, what's the on-site requirements, and for how long, of course. There are other uh, great, great examples as well. I'm sure you guys could, could uh, share some with us that we would, we would, uh, uh, that would help everyone as well. So we can talk about that in the Q and A. Elizabeth. So vendor truth. Most vendors are looking for repeatable revenue. They are not looking for one time come in, sell it, and leave. They are looking for a way to stick around for as long as possible with repeatable revenue. That gives them a platform to understand um, the organization, future business opportunities, and to, which can be, by the way, beneficial to both sides, not just vendors. It's not a bad thing if you figure out how to use it to your advantage. But repeatable revenue is the name of the game. So as you're negotiating with your vendors, knowing that will help you position your negotiations in a way that um, can get you uh, more advantages on the DDI phase of the project if, and still enable you to constrain the downstream uh, path of the project. Most vendors, and I'm sure most of you have seen this, prefer cash earlier. If you can play with the cash, and I don't mean play in a negative way, I mean um, many, many states try to push the funding or cash very downstream. And, and vendors have to build in the cost of capital to their estimation so that if they are effectively borrowing from the vendor's you know, assets, they have to pay an interest rate to, most, to the central office for the use of that cash. So that's costly. So again, cash on time, and when I say earlier, I mean on time correlated to the deliverables, can be incredibly helpful to uh, negotiations while still making sure that you keep yourself protected that you're not, in the case of a meltdown or a problem contract, you're, you're not going to have a vendor walk away from you because they've gotten all the money that they think that they deserve. And hopefully you guys have not seen that uh, very often, if at all. Know also that public vendors have to answer to shareholders. That's a reality of their lives. It's pretty rare these days that you have a major vendor doing a SACWIS or CWIS type of, of implementation um, that's not uh, a publicly held organization. Some product vendors I know are private, but, but most of the DDI vendors are going to be larger scale. 
you know, that is the reality of their life, and you as the negotiator on the state side need to understand that they have to be able to tell a story that's a credible story to their shareholders and make enough of a profit for the project to make sure that they actually um, will stay at a reasonable stock price in the market. Vendors with a substantial local presence may behave differently. This is not a universal truth, but sometimes vendors who know that they want to stay in a local area, if you have a state executive, if you have project teams who work within your physical location, sometimes vendors behave differently if they know that they aren't going to pack up and leave, um, and they're, less, they're more inclined to invest in making things right than vendors who might choose to leave. You have to watch for this. It is not a universal truth, but it is occasionally. I see behavior like this on an occasional basis. And then finally, most vendors incent their senior employees on profit. Um, it's rare these days that vendors will incent their senior employees on revenue. It used to be that way, but now they mostly incent their senior employees on profit. So that means that your senior executives and project managers are typically incented in such a way that they have to control the cost side as well as the revenue side. Um, and that just will help you understand kind of what's on their pathway. Next slide, Elizabeth. So in terms of contract negotiation objectives, Don's going to go into strategies in a little more detail. But I just wanted to give you some sense of uh, objectives. Our sense is that if you can sit down with your team and define the overarching objectives for the contract negotiation in priority order, that it can be very useful for you. And we typically take that to a, road, a negotiations roadmap where I'm actually laying out for each day that we plan to be together what we hope to accomplish. And that's a published schedule ahead of time, and we're all working our way through it. You obviously need to include establishing and confirming the major elements and establishing and, and uh, uh, ensuring that there are re reasonable behavioral expectations of the parties in the room. And just know that, and Don, again, Don's going to give you the detail on this, just know that investment um, taken to figure out the objectives and the strategy will really pay off for the project. OK, well, walk into those um, contract negotiation strategies. And as Cynthia said, um, the objective of is really knowing when you walk into that negotiation um, a list of your priorities. You need to rank them. You need to be ready, along with having discussions um, about alternatives. You will have read the proposals. You'll know what. Um, the vendors have proposed. So you need to really be aware and be ready to have them prioritized and be ready to offer some, you know, some counter to if you're really not liking the response. So have some alternatives ready that you can actually discuss during those negotiations. And as you're doing that, you need to truly establish the difference between what is needed and what is wanted. I think this is one of the hardest things to really get to defining what is mandatory and what is desirable and trying to really break down that from the, the whether it's a business requirement or whether it's a technical requirement, truly getting to um, understanding the difference and making sure that everybody that's going to be at the table truly understands that. So that's part of knowing your bottom line. Where, where are you not going to give on? And so you know, if you came up with alternatives, you might have some ideas of how this could be met. You know what is definitely needed and what is not. And then know what your bottom line is, what you're going to be able to give on or not, or compromise on. And then you need to understand the compensated, compensation, including total cost. Um, the deliverable cost, the payment schedule, and enhancements for future cost. Um, I think Cynthia hit on it that vendors definitely would rather have their cash up front. Totally understand that, having been a vendor and had to pay interest on money that we're expending on the project. So it is in everybody's best interest to try to understand the whole cost of the project, and try to negotiate how you can you know, keep some cash going to the vendors, but also then have that ability to um, not be in a bad situation if you get into the contract and something doesn't go in the way that you um, expected it to. And you need leverage 
Um, we actually have a couple contracts going on here in Enterprise Services that, unfortunately, we're having to use that leverage because of the, um, the non-performance in the vendor. So, but it, it's a balance, and I think we talked, Cynthia talked about that earlier. It's a balance in, in trying to keep the vendor whole so that they can provide quality service, quality staffing, but yet put the protections in there. Um, define your time constraints and benchmarks. Um, very, very key. And then define key dates and triggers. And that really ties back to the Washington model that we, we have used is those those key dates and triggers to be evaluating through when you're negotiating to define many of those things instead of some of the typical um, projects that I have either negotiated before or been on is the vendor will come on board and then they have 30 to 60 days to do a work plan. And then you have that work plan that then starts driving things, may start changing payment schedules and so forth. And we are taking the approach here on our major deals is we do not do a work plan after the fact. We do the work plan as part of um, we would ask the vendor to put it forth in their proposal, and then we do that as part of negotiations. So we, we don't have that surprise after um, the vendor comes on board with a work plan 60 days later. Um, next slide, Elizabeth. Okay, identify risks and liabilities. Um, these are, this really ties back also to in the Washington model that we were talking about where you um, need to have issues identified up front that would be things that might be contractual issues. But identify the risks with the project, um, liabilities that um, you need to talk through right during the no negotiations. Uh, fully understand confidentiality and dispute resolution and impact of changes to requirements. I think this is um, one of those uh, impact to changes of requirement is where you really do run into those change orders. But I think the, the confidentiality in, um, in the negotiations and then coming up with a very clear dispute resolution that everybody can agree to is one of the most, most key things. That probably in our last deal took most time over everything else. Identify and resolve gaps, issues, called horse trading. List that gets resolved at the end of negotiations. Um, this, is, this is one for me is not giving too soon on things that you feel are very important. So when you've ranked your list and your priorities, as I talked about in a slide before, and you have those there, you know, you, you don't have to give on things right away. You can set aside things aside, you can table them to come back to later because as you continue to go through negotiations, you're going to have a list of these items. And some are going to be more important than others. So, you know, one of my recommendations was, you know, don't give too soon. Um, just put it aside in a list. And also, you don't have to play hardball right away when you're doing that. So as you're gathering those lists and those things as you're coming through, what, you know, my tactic to do there is to have that list of things, and as you move further into the negotiations, you come back and you reprioritize, and then you start being able to negotiate and compromise on some of those things, because some things may become of much more value to you than others. And if through your negotiations you have created um, the right atmosphere that allows both parties to be positive, they're getting mutually beneficial um, feedback while achieving a fair deal. It really is. You can, you know, figure out where you're going to give throughout because you set those priorities. So at, at different points in time, both parties are giving and you've, you've built that great relationship. And then you need, before you close, get to those harder things where you would do that horse trading. So it really is building the relationship. And for me, one of the things that I, I would want to tie back to in the approach that we're, we're using on large deals here in Washington is those interviews that happen in stage um, two and then again in stage three, you really are getting to know the people you're going to be negotiating with because our requirement was the people we were going to be interviewing during those stages would be the people that would be at the table during negotiations. And so really trying to develop that, re that um, relationship back at those stages of how did those um, 
discussions about their issues go? How did those relationships form? You know, what type of people were they sending? Were they sending people to the table that could make decisions? And then you've already built some um, rapport with those folks that you then are in negotiations, and this usually is with more than one vendor at this time. And Don, don't you also guys also want to have the delivery people in the room at the same time? Absolutely. It, yeah. So it is the, the key project staff. So thank you for reminding me, Cynthia, because yeah. th this is really important too. And one of the lessons learned we've had out of a couple of these deals is not all the time were the key project people there during some of the negotiations, and then we had to come back to those folks and say, but this is what we negotiated. So it's very key that you have from the state and vendor side the, um, the executives that can make the decisions, but also the key staff that are actually going to have to deliver on what got agreed to in the negotiations. Yeah, it's important that they understand what the horse trading has identified Absolutely. and also understand that the whole discussion about scope, the detailed discussion about scope as part of the conversation. And here's the back and forth that happens um, between, because I think when they hear those conversations, they understand what, what the driving factors were. Right. The other thing I've done on this slide is is I, I regularly um, advise clients to put uh, ask the vendors as part of their RFP to identify risks and mitigating strategies that they see in the project coming up. And inevitably, if the vendor's done a good job there, that provides you with a great risk management paradigm to start from, and you can discuss that as part of the negotiation conversations if you think that that would be a helpful thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in um, the stage two where we have issues, that is where vendors really have, they've raised any issues they have with what they think that, that the state is asking for along with the risk that you can actually have some of those discussions um, up front before you get way into the negotiations. Right. But, so the approach, the four-stage approach is really meant to, people say, well, doesn't that take a long time? It does take a little longer. but. It gets you at the table when you're at the end. It really takes the negotiations to a faster track because you've worked through so many things in those upfront stages before you actually get to the final stages of negotiating. Right. And even if you're doing the gold standard version and you, you haven't gotten all the way to the four-stage uh, Washington model, which I think is sort of next generation, but even if you're doing the gold standard where you're negotiating before you sign and you're doing it in detail with the teams in the room, um, you will be better served as well. Absolutely. Um, and, and that is, um, you know, before I left the child welfare arena and work, that is, that is the model that we used. And it was very tedious but it was going through all of that to make sure you have a clear understanding from both parties um, what the proposal really meant, what it said, going through the requirements. It really is laborious, but it is so um, important to not have people having assumptions or they interpret it in a different way. So going through that and having that dialogue is, is definitely key in any deal in really understanding what you're signing up for. You don't want to be having that discussion afterwards that, well, I thought you meant this by that and meant that by this. So definitely very key. So let's go to the next slide, Elizabeth. Um, and, and this is one that, that um, I use. And so that's why it's kind of in here with folks um, to really try to educate them, especially when we're doing a major deal and an enterprise deal, is, um, and this is one, the don't, is not to underestimate the depths that vendors will go to to gain access to every buyer influencer within state agencies and the legislature. And, and I've had this challenge. Um, we are in Olympia. My, my agency is in Olympia, as is um, it's the capital, and so there are many lobbyists. There are many different influences. Um, so it's been an interesting process um, to be paying attention to how folks are trying to influence, and as we have other major deals come up. So I really, when we share and we're talk, starting to talk about a deal, we really try to educate um, a number of different, and especially key legislators and key agencies about this. And then the, the other counterpart about this is to try to get um, agreement that um, there should only be, you know, a core negotiating team. There should only be one voice 
and one face to the vendors, not a, a variety, because I found myself in awkward situations where um, others are representing um, the project or where we're going forward, and it really isn't um, the path that we're going on. So it really is try to educate people to um, help support you in not having that contract outside the core negotiation team, and then to maintain that one voice. And I, I think this is the big, biggest one, and the one we've had to educate people on, is recognize that proper planning is an investment in the outcome. Um, and it, it is an investment. It takes time, but it does get you to a better end. And the other one would be stay true to the plan, and, and results will follow. So let's go to the next slide. So this, was, this, so this is the process I use with folks to have faith and trust in the process. The process works. We've had a number of these major deals where people are starting to get that are at the table that might be observers that start to get really nervous. Why? I, 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 we walked away today. I don't think they're going to come back. I don't think this is going to work out. It's like, you know, we need people. People need t different time to process. Just have faith in it. Let's, you know, let's just keep moving through the process. Um, this was a challenge going through some of the stages um, when we maybe eliminated somebody from a stage. They're like, well, should we really be eliminating them? Are we going to be in a protest? And you really, it's educating everyone on that we were very clear in our RFP. We were very clear on how you would move from stages and so forth. So just, you know, have faith in the process. And then the next slide is probably one of the most important ones. Elizabeth, if you want to move to the next slide. Be prepared to walk away um, in negotiations. And I would say, you know, this is probably on the vendor side, When having been a vendor, it's a really difficult thing to do, too. But sometimes I think it is something that you need to do if you're finding that this just isn't going to be able to be a deal that um, you can... Um, that can be beneficial for both sides. When Cynthia was talking earlier that both sides will be a little happy and a little unhappy, well, if that unhappy starts getting to be too heavy, um, you need to be able to be prepared to walk away. And that is the last two deals that we used this stage with that we really had a lot of conversation about. Even though you've made a huge investment, um, you need to be prepared to walk away. And, and I'll talk a little bit about why when we get to the next slide which is benefits and expected outcomes. And so these deals are 15 to 25-year deals. Um, you know, and I know in the child welfare arena, the systems that are out there have been out there for a lot of years. You have, you know, if you're signing up with a vendor, as um, Cynthia talked about before, there is usually always some long-term relationship with that vendor. Um, whether it's software as a service, whether it's a cot, or whether it is, you know, a custom design development and implementation, most cases there is a long-term relationship. And these systems are and stay in place, unfortunately, longer than they should. Um, we have systems here that are 30 years old that are enterprise systems. And so, you know, really walking away from someone you don't think you can have a partnership with is, is important. So establishing gender and state senior executive buy-in to the relationship and the project success is probably one of the most key things. The people you are negotiating with, the people you're going through the evaluation process, can you work with those people and will it be a good and beneficial for um, the state for the next 15 to 25 years? Uh, the other benefits and expected outcomes is to reduce ambiguity in expectations. And that was really kind of whether we used whatever approach you use, the Washington, the Model 1, what, whatever approach you use, you really need to make sure you're clear, um, which then helps reduce your risk of project fail or failure based on assumptions from either party. And so it is working through all of that in your um, negotiations. And then a better, more firm commitment to the project and the relationship so that people on both sides truly understand what the project is, not just a, a high level. There's a clear understanding what the expectations, what the goal and the end result needs to be, which I think really lead to better financial terms for both the project and long-term costs. 
and really understanding what are those long-term costs, you know, going to be. Um, it, it, and as we move into a different world from custom, and we and potentially child welfare eventually will get to COTS or software as a service, it really is going to take us into um, a, a, a different world of negotiating and um, how those costs and long term are going to be um, impacting the state and the vendors. Elizabeth. So from a best practices standpoint, uh, number one topic, have your senior executive commitment lined up. I know this is arguably the most difficult thing to make to ensure that we've talked about today, especially in government environments. But you you have to do, do the best that you can to make sure that your senior executives understand the project and support the expenditure ahead of the negotiation. You have to create... And in many cases, I am working with senior executives who know nothing about these kinds of contracts and uh, nothing about these kinds of projects. And there's almost has to be uh, several primer sort of ser a series of, of primer experiences where I where I and my clients are describing the content of the negotiation, the contract of content of the RFP, even after it's been led, of course, and the content of the actual project so that people can, senior executives can understand their role and can understand when you want them to intercede and when you don't. Um, but they have to be on board. Uh, and I have seen clients uh, appropriately walk away. I've seen many things break down if the executives are not briefed ahead of time and not lined up. And I've also seen a couple of clients have the strength to say to their executive, look, it just doesn't feel like you're behind this enough to move forward. So you also have to figure out not just setting them up so they understand it, but also your briefing model for your senior executives regularly during the, the negotiation. And also think carefully about how to utilize them at the right time as an actor for the escalation. Not only would, can they add value to you in terms of their perspective um, at that level and how they feel about the, the most uh, critical or prioritized dimensions of the project or the requirements, depending on how you're using them, but also using them as an actor to come in and be the deal maker or the deal, um, you know, the person who says, look, this is just not appropriate, we're going to have to walk away, at the right moment can be very, very powerful. So figure out, line them up and figure out how to use them effectively once they are um, bought into your, to your process. Selecting the right people uh, to be in the room and outside the room. Uh, you know, inside the room you want people who are not ruled by their emotions, not feeling like they have to win every transaction. People who understand the requirements and issues, who are detailed, who are creative, and are good negotiators. Often I've seen negotiations derail because um, one of the parties gets personally invested in the content and or winning a point, and it's less about what's the right thing for the, for the joint product and more about, you know, how can I win this particular point because it's really important to me personally. So you have to have people who can rise above that and, and remember the priorities that you've set ahead of time and the roadmap that you've set ahead of time and, and also the vendor context and move forward with the stuff that's most important. Obviously you, need, obviously, you need the right set of skills, legal, financial, technical, business program, project management, negotiation, and able, people who are able to understand the downstream impacts of decisions made at the table and articulate those in a way that's meaningful to everyone. Not all those people have to be in the room during the entire time so that if you created a roadmap that's an effective roadmap, you can have the legal guides at the right time or the technical guides at the right time. I would argue that your PM and probably your deputy, if you're lucky enough to have one. So at least two people from the state side of the project team need to be in all the meetings. Um, and potentially, if you have a principal negotiator that's different uh, from those two people, and I would generally think that's a useful thing. You want to have your principal negotiator be, hopefully, the person who's not going to have to work day to day with the downstream project team, because that person does need to be able to have a great relationship if you end up in a deal together. And sometimes, if you're doing the negotiations, you have to be the bad guy, and so you want that person potentially not to be the PM. But you also have to have the project senior people, the actual delivery people in the room, so there's continuity throughout. And you also want an analyst to record the discussion. This is this should be a state person, as Dawn said. The people who 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 are penning the results are the people who who control 
the documentation, and there is significant advantage to that. I also want to make the point that this is not an administrative role. This is an analyst role. Um, often I've seen um, state um, uh, environments and negotiation environments where um, we've asked the executive secretary to be the recorder, and they are not going to bring you um, the same level of analytics that you need in order to have your changes to the requirements or your list of horse trading issues. You, you need somebody who really has an understanding of the content and is a good analyst to help create those lists and uh, manage them with you over time. Next slide, please. Also, we talked about understanding the deal. You, you, I've also been in environments where people are walking into the room and just reading the deal for the first time. Um, that will obviously slow you down pretty substantially and not put you in the position to get to the right level of negotiated endpoints that you are looking for. And then um, formulating the negotiation strategy and briefing the team. We've talked about this already, alternative approaches. Define your tactics and counter tactics so that you as a group are working uh, are swimming sort of toward the same destination. You know who's bad cop, you know who's good cop, to use, the, to use a, a pretty rudimentary euphemism, but also understanding your vendor context and figuring out how to, how to make those tactics work. To Don's point earlier, developing a prioritized list of must-haves and um, nice-to-haves, and also know the other parties must-have, and that's part of the vendor context understanding that we talked about. Next slide, Elizabeth. Defining roles and responsibilities, we've talked about the escalation process. I always keep a couple of upper layers on each side out of the room so no emotions are involved in final decisions with the goal for them to be able to resolve issues that are not resolved in the room. And, you know, carefully allow yourself escalation possibilities. Day one, you can't reach an agreement. You might put it on your parking lot list for tomorrow or two days hence. Try to do maybe a little thinking or conversation outside the room and then come back and see if you can, you can resolve it. If you can't, then maybe move it to your escalation process. Prioritize your concessions. You, you, this horse trading list can get long and, and hairy. Uh, figure out what's important about it and try to be creative with it. Um, understand the risk cost value. We've talked about this. Know when to walk away. I wholeheartedly uh, second Dawn's point about this being a critical tactic. I would not use it a lot, um, but use it at the critical points that you need to use it. Document the roadmap. Secure the executive approval. Also, we haven't talked about this. Using the right technology, um, I believe in joint editing in real time if possible. So I actually project whatever I'm writing on the wall. And you can have two or three projectors going if you need to with your analysts um, using those and have everybody watch as edits are made or changes are made or the lists are created um, so that they can actually see uh, and agree on what's going on and there's no confusion downstream. The other point we wanted to make here is that you know you can do a lot over the phone these days and through webinars, but, but in order to forge the kind of relationships that we're talking about in what is effectively a marriage, a 20-year plus marriage, it's very useful to have people face-to-face -face in the room for key parts of the negotiation. In fact, I would argue for the majority of this process that we're talking about. Next slide, please. So bottom line, ensure your executive commitment ahead of time. Know your vendor's context. Know your RFP. Assemble the right team, tools, and strategy for your negotiation. Walk away when it doesn't make sense. Remember, it's not a sprint, but it's a marathon and you need to make sure that the people in the room behave accordingly. You're also going to have the better project by forging good working relationships now, even if the negotiations are tough. The investment now will pay off. And your best, if everyone walks away a little disgruntled or dissatisfied, you're looking for a balance. You're not looking for the win or to win. And that's a key attitudinal um, baseline that you need to establish with your team. Great, thank you. Don, I didn't know if you had anything else you wanted to add? No, I think we covered it and, and then covered it again for folks, so I think we're ready for questions. <laughs> no.
No, you both. Let me take this opportunity to thank you both. I had been uh, privy to the planning for this presentation, but but learned so much more today. So I, I think you all covered a lot of ground in a very short time, and I, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you both for such a um, thoughtful and thorough presentation. I think it was particularly helpful to sort of compare and contrast the state perspective with the vendor perspective, um, and I think your point is very well taken, that if you understand the vendor perspective, that obviously strengthens your ability to, to conduct um, effective contract negotiations. So thank you both. Uh, Don, the operator, Don, now if you could let us know how folks can go ahead and queue up for questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1, unmute your phone, and record your name clearly. Your name is required to introduce your question. If you need to withdraw your question, press star 2. Again, to ask a question, please press star 1. It will take a few moments for the questions to come through. Please stand by. Okay, and while we're waiting for people to line up for questions, I do have a few that came in online, um, not specified towards either one of you, so, you know, jump in. Um, what is the role of the executive sponsor in negotiations? Um, active and involved, safe to come in for bogged down negotiations, some other role. Um, how do you both see that? Don, go ahead. So, executive sponsor um, here in Washington, does not necessarily get involved in the negotiations. How I've used um, executive sponsors, so I'm actually usually the executive that's in the negotiations, but the executive sponsor from a business perspective, um, how I would utilize them is if we were coming to a standstill and we needed to revisit um, our situation of deciding if we needed to walk away, reestablishing priorities. If we couldn't get agreement um, on an alternative approach or a compromise, I would, you know, take that to the executive sponsor for discussion to see if there's any room to open. I would hope we would know all that going in, um, but there, I can think of some occasions where that that might occur. It's it's not necessarily common if you've had a lot of dialogue ahead of time. So I hope that helps. But Cynthia, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I'm also used. I'm with Don. I I don't think they're classically in the room. I think you use them for escalation, and I think you use them in the way I was describing earlier as this actor, if you need it, if you need it. And hopefully, the acting that they are doing is shaking hands with the executive sponsor from the vendor side in a way that makes everybody happy at the end. That's ideal. And I think the key that Cynthia said earlier is the project manager that has to have an ongoing relationship needs to be in the room but shouldn't be the negotiator. And that is usually kind of the role that I play because I don't have to have that day-to-day -day relationship with the project team and, and so forth. And I think the main negotiator from the vendor should not be that person that you have to, you know, start up a project and work through. So I, I think that helps to have those different layers of folks in the negotiations. Right. And Don, in that way, you're acting as a skilled negotiator on behalf of the program side yes. and the technical side of the house. Correct. Yeah. So one of, I can't remember which one, but one of the two of you, I think, said that walking away is a notion that provokes a lot of anxiety for people. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like I'm kind of seeing this a little because I do have a question about, several questions here about walking away. Um, should you seek higher level approval to walk away before you enter into the negotiations? It, it seems like it might be above, that kind of decision might be above the pay grade of um, the people who are actually in the room doing the negotiations. So could you, could you speak to that a little bit uh, about that decision to walk away? So that is where I was going with how would I use that executive um, mm -hmm. business sponsor. And to walk away, I would want to have that dialogue with them and be prepared to share with them why we would be recommending walking away. Um, but I would, you know, I would say that that would need to be at that level. But I don't think you should be discouraged from taking that that data, that information, the situation to that executive and be, you know, be at that point of recommending walking away. Right. And in, and in the, I'm totally supportive. And in the, I have two points here. In the, as Dawn described it, you said the executive, if you've done your job preparing the executive for the negotiation, you know what their, the, their priorities are. You've talked to them about what you think the issues are. You've kept them up to 
date probably on what's happening at a reasonable level so that the walking away part should not be a surprise. They should be supportive and understand it in the context. That's point one. Point two, though, the, re the other reality is often when you walk away, that will provoke movement on the other side. Absolutely. So, Dawn, I would wager that most of your walking away has not resulted in the project not moving forward, but has resulted in breaking through some kind of road jam, log jam. Absolutely. My la the last deal that I negotiated, we walked away twice, and it did not end the negotiations. It ended up bringing us to a compromise. Right. And I think more than twice would be a problem. That would indicate to me we had a deeper problem in the team that was working together or the deal. But I think that, that if you use it very judiciously and at the right time, it can be very powerful. So and we'll usually result to, in that. Sorry. It's not something you want to do unless you're prepared to actually follow through on it. So it's Absolutely. not you have to make it as an idle threat. Absolutely. But, it's not an idle threat. Yeah. Okay. Um, and yet another question online, uh, which is, what is one thing that you would do differently if you could? Or do you have any, any war stories about past negotiations and, and some good lessons learned? Well, I know Cynthia probably has them too, but I, I have one right now that <clears throat> we thought we did everything that we should have done. But one of the things that I would say that we, if we had it to do over again, we would have had a better understanding through all of the work we did with the vendor in advance. I thought we covered everything, but one piece that I think we, we neglected was to truly understand the vendor's methodology and approaches to things. And could that methodology and approach really fit with um, our organization and we could adjust to that me methodology and approach? And we really missed the mark on um, one of our deals on really um, understanding that because it should have been something we either should have truly understood and been ready to adjust to or potentially negotiated an adjustment to that methodology because it became a, a hindrance to the project and a disappointment in um, our business folks and our technical folks in what they were receiving as deliverables. Their, their expectation was something very different than what the results of the methodology provided. So to me, it, it is, you, you can never not understand enough of that ahead of time, especially if you have a shop that actually does work themselves, does do some design and development or configuration or uh, any types of documentation and so forth. It, it's a little harder when you're seeing something that is so very, very different than what your people are accustomed to because it makes the approval process very hard, so it can cause delays. I feel like I have a war story for every best practice and pretty much everything that we said. <laughs> so let me let me piggyback on Don's point. I have seen that that point in spades, especially when you're talking about a product or a platform situation where the client or or an outsourcing situation where the vendor has a particular methodology and a particular set of documentation that meets their needs, but often doesn't speak to the business business uh, user. So I think that Don's point about, and that's, it's all embedded in the words that we use. We, we just didn't give you full detail about all, all of them. So understanding the proposal, the RFP, all that stuff, includes understanding their methodology as well. But literally, I've made so many mistakes and had so many illuminating experiences and contracts, and every one of, I could talk about any one of these topics at length. <laughs> be careful what you offer, because we yeah. will be calling you again for another webinar. <laughs> totally cool, totally cool. <laughs> I mean, executive so, sponsors, I've had them not I mean, I, you know, we could, we could probably both go on forever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions on the phone? I'm showing no questions over the phone at this time. Okay. Um, so this is actually what you had just said. It's kind of, I think, a nice... Um, a nice transition, but in selecting your state negotiation team, the people from the state who are going to be in the room, how do you select the right mix of backgrounds? How do you how do you even figure out things like how many people need to be in there? How many is too many? Um, how do you figure out who's going to take the lead? Um, I know you had talked about having people um, sort of be the quote unquote bad cop that would be people that that don't need to be involved sort of in the daily work once it it moves forward. But can you talk about that a little bit more? I would start with this. I would start with the deal and understand the sort of major components of the deal. You always want a negotiator You always who understands stuff. You always, as we've talked about, that's Dawn in the Washington environments. You always want the operational people who are going to carry the project forward, right? And then you have to look at kind of what the other dimensions of the deal are. Is it mostly technical? Is it mostly functional? You know, do you, do you, are you looking at sort of match to, to 
your functional requirements, you need to look at the skill set that we articulated on one of the earlier slides and figure out what skills you need in the room and go after the best people you can, depending on the scale of the deal, to support you through that. I mean, I think you're best off in the five or six range. Dawn, I don't know what your experience is, but that's mine. I, I would agree with that. Um, being an enterprise organization, we have a lot more people that want to be part of it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we spend a great deal of time on is going through roles and responsibilities. Exactly. And identify a lot of people that are just observers. And so you do need the functional side, the technical side, the legal side, the negotiation side. The I physical side. When, yeah, when I'm there, I don't do a lot of discussing. It really is the people that have the in-depth skills so you identify who's going to be your technical representative, who's your business. It's not good to have a variety of people talking and challenging. And if you can be very disciplined about just calling for a caucus when you know somebody might be concerned. You know, we had signals that we did that people were uncomfortable about something, so we would break and have a dialogue. Um, but you have to figure out who are the voices at the table. And, um, and, and be clear about that and defining your roadmap and roles and responsibilities. Yeah, it, it is really, it, it's really key because I think that you can be at a disadvantage because someone might not think they're really saying something that would, should maybe not be said at that time, and all of a sudden you really have a hard time taking it back. Mm -hmm. And it also helps manage the emotions that come in the room. Mm -hmm. So related to that, we've, we've had another question pop up online, which is how often do you think that state staff are trained or experienced in this, and how do you... How do you prepare them, or how do you recommend that they be prepared? It, it sounds very clearly like this is not something where you just, you know, invite people to the meeting and they show up without any advanced preparation, but you do a lot of work to prep your team is, before the meeting. That is a fabulous question. I have an it answer, Don. Do you want to start? You. <laughs> you go ahead. And you answer, and then I'll follow up behind you. Okay. So the environments that this has been most successful in, I have seen, um, and uh, you know, you need to figure out if you have somebody, you have people inside your organization who have the skill set. And if you don't, you need to acquire it. I've seen, in, I'm in Ohio, I've been in Ohio not traveling for like the last 10 years. And I've seen for at various points in organizations the hiring of an external consultant to help coach uh, the state staff on how to do these skills because they are, they are never, in my experience, skills that are endemic within the organization. Help coach people through putting it together and develop the skill set needed in order to make it work. And I hate to say you somebody who's got the skill set, but again, the investment now will pay off later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would agree with Cynthia. Um, it, it is hard to find those, those right skill sets. And once you do find them, you do continue to use them. Right. Uh, and and uh, many times they not, might not be people that are going to be part of the project, but when you do find those skills, you um, definitely continue to mentor and coach and utilize those types of folks. So it does. It's a huge investment up front, but I also agree with Cynthia. If you do not have those folks, you need to acquire them because you have to remember that this is a long-term deal you're walking into. Like Cynthia said, a marriage, you know, 20 plus years, so it is worth the investment to have the right people um, mm -hmm. at the table working this through. You do not want the vendor to have a greater advantage than you, and vice versa. It, it, it has to be a fair deal. If you're, if you're getting too good of a deal, it won't be a good deal in the end. If you're, you don't have skilled people at the table and the vendor is taking advantage of that, that won't be a good deal in the end either because that will just end up in disputes and um, dissatisfaction. So it is, it's worth the investment. And if you don't have the folks, you need to acquire them. I'm also seeing, I have to say, I'm also seeing small consulting firms that specialize in this Absolutely. have popped up in a couple of the states that I have been in. And you don't want your classic major vendors to be doing this because they're typically on the other side of the table. You want the people who, or you can hire them, like Washington's been lucky enough to hire Dawn, right? Um, you want to find the, the small consulting firms by talking to your, to your other state friends who specialize in this particular kind of advice and counsel and development of the state staff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that marriage analogy, too, and it, it sounds like sort of one of the take-home lessons today is that it's better to um, leave your vendor at the altar than to have to seek an annulment after the fact. So, just, like, just like with a marriage. 
Yes, it just is. like in, in life. Um, Dawn, the operator, I just wanted to check before I, I went back to online questions to see if we had anybody who's been waiting on the phone. I show no questions over the phone. Okay, that's because they're all typing them into the chat box. Um, so to follow up, and it's maybe a little bit off topic, but um, would you make would you, would you make the same recommendation of um, hiring a consultant or using a consultant for the state on learning how to actually manage the contract? So moving past the negotiation, but you've made the award and now you've got to manage this contract. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It, de it depends. It depends on your skill sets and the skill sets of your organization. If your organization historically has not been, I, I liken it to maturity. I've now worked in four or five different human services program areas, and in the same way that you develop maturity on how to be effective at large scale projects as state as a state, you develop the same kind of maturity with contract negotiations. You develop the same kind of, a, of maturity with contract management. By and large, I think contract management is, is a pretty unsung discipline within state organizations that I've been involved with. So um, it feels, I, I have not seen, though, the same level of um, consulting support arise in that discipline yet. But I think that if you can either figure out within your state who's done an effective job of that or figure out a consulting resource to support you there, I, I think it would be a great investment. Okay. John, I don't know if you agree with that. Yeah, I, for me, um, I, I think that it does vary. And do you have the strength? And that really would be something you'd have to self-assess on yourself because it is key. You can have this awesome contract, and you could have negotiated it. You could have paid somebody to help you negotiate it, and and here you go. And if you don't have someone to to stay on it and manage it, that that is, is very difficult. And I. I do understand that is a challenge. And I, I guess my recommendation would be there, if you do need to outsource, which I can understand why you would. I'm thinking about a, a variety of different situations with agencies and stuff where they would need to, is at least try to find somebody that you could couple with them, deputies, yes. and try to build those skills yes. within your organization. Because it's very important that you do have those internal folks and that you're building that skill set and, and capacity. And so for me, that, that having joined back into the public sector, it's probably one of the things I'm most focused on is that trying not to have dependency in anywhere more than it should be and finding that balance and looking for opportunities to grow people within the yes. public sector with these skill sets. Now, the, the risk goes with that is you've built their skill sets so great that they're leaving you and they're going on to um, work for one of the consulting firms. But then if that does happen, I feel like we succeeded at, you know, actually building that capacity and we did get the value in being the public sector out of that. So I, I definitely agree if you don't have the skills, you, you need to hire it in, but try to try to um, balance it with somebody you could potentially call a deputy or something to try to acquire those skills. In fact, Donna, I would push it one step further and say that it should it needs to be a state person in charge of the contract management. And I would I would get, bring in a skilled contract management support person that works on behalf of that state person, but the decisions and um, primary activity with the vendor needs to be done by the state person. You don't want to outsource that completely. You want to outsource the the sort of activities involved in that and, and the education of the state person through the state person. Mm -hmm. So someone online has said, well said, both of you. <laughs> Go ahead, Dawn. I think that, you know, one of the things you have to be cautious of as we've um, Cynthia and I have both talked about through this whole presentation is building a relationship, building a relationship, having a win-win, building a relationship, which is very, very important. But you also can never forget that there is a vendor state situation there. And right. there should be, from time to time, some strain on that. And I have seen situations where that, that relationship became too clouded that, that we, you might tend to not look and pay attention to things that you should be. So there, there needs to be that um, a great relationship, but the ability to be able to also have hard conversations. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you see that I've backed the slides up, and uh, that's because somebody has asked if you could talk a little bit more about the structure, structure of Model 3, the in-flight or evolving model. Sure. 
I've seen this. Uh, I've worked with this a lot in Ohio um, in the human services arena. They, for their large scale and even some small scale um, uh, enhancement um, projects, where they really don't know where they're going from quarter to quarter because there's legislative stuff underway or, or it's just sort of the normal evolution of these big systems. They have these things called IDAs. And the IDA is an interval deliverable attachment. And every quarter, um, the beginning of the, or the end of the prior quarter, I sit down with the project manager and define the scope with associated deliverables for the next quarter. We actually negotiate those from a contents and scope standpoint. We specify them on a on an IDA or interim deliverable attachment, and we um, price them, and I price them, and they agree or disagree, and we negotiate, and we essentially do that every quarter, and we deliver to that deliverable setup. Okay. All right. It's really cool because it enables you. I really like it because it enables you as a vendor to be responsive to your client needs in a way that if you're stuck in a large scale, you know, list of stuff. Um, you aren't as able to do because you've defined it at the beginning when you didn't know as much as you do now. But it also takes you away from a classic t and model where you, as a state, don't really know what you're getting and you can really force it to a deliverables construct. Okay, perfect. So I hope that answers it for whoever sent the question in. But if not, please uh, hop back onto the chat box and let us know. Um, so a word or a role that I haven't heard either of you mention today, and, and I'm a little surprised, um, and I promise to read this question verbatim. Um, neither of you have said bring your lawyers to the table. How do you bring equity and balance to the negotiating table when the vendors bring in their, and this is the part I promised to read, slick New York lawyers? <laughs> you do bring your lawyer to the table. Yeah. Yeah, it's, okay. it's actually shown on the downstream slide when we said, oh, what, sorry, who okay. do you want to bring to the room? Yeah, okay. Absolutely. And um, I think that I've been at deals where they haven't had their lawyers, and then you don't bring your lawyer until it's the right time. But if their lawyer is at the table, your lawyer is at the table all of the time. But okay. pick a good lawyer if you can. <laughs> Correct. Pick a lawyer <laughs> who understands their job is to further the business, not to stall it. Now, and this is something also that we um, in the state of Washington, for large deals, we do contract out also. Um, attorney support that has expertise in the area that we're going to be doing a contract. So this is, and we call them a special AG, but they really are uh, an attorney firm that we would hire. So we also have our state attorney general lawyer there. But in very large or very complex situations, it is where I think it is worth the money to um, bring the attorney to the table that has the experience with whatever the uh, type of technology, whether it's you know um, software as a service, it's costs, it's custom, because sometimes the attorneys within organizations don't have the skill set when it comes to technology. Mm -hmm. And it's something, I'm glad somebody brought up because we didn't really hit on that very much. But to me, that would be um, money well spent. We both kind of assumed it. Okay. Yes. Yep. Um, this question I love because I am an in-the-weeds person, and so inevitably I'm the person in the room that, that takes us you know, too far into the weeds. Um, can you speak to the appropriate level of negotiation? How do you decide if something is worth negotiating about? Um, you could review every one of 800-plus RFP requirements down to the nth detail, but that would take forever, um, and it's probably not cost-effective. So is there some sort of guideline about... Uh, the impact that something would have on schedule or price or we're only going to negotiate things that carry a certain amount of risk on the schedule or a certain number of dollars per price increase, something like that. Don, go ahead if you want to. Well, um, so for me, there's nothing that, that is – so the four-stage approach that we use in Washington or even the approach that Cynthia was talking about in um, the strongly preferred Model 1 where you spend a couple weeks going through the requirements and getting clarification. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know how to answer that other than I think it's not a matter of negotiations. It's a matter of truly understanding what somebody's offering you. So you walk in, you know what your RFP, you've reviewed, you understand um, how they've proposed and what they've proposed for you and what concerns or issues you might have with that, which kind of ties back to a list of your priorities 
and issues that you might want. So I think when you do go through that into negotiations, you'll know what's important, what's not, what you need, what you don't need, what you can give on. Um, I don't know that I could give you just a... I think if any, I think you want to make sure that you and you you guys are all living with congruent assumptions. Yeah. So I would say you have to go through a reasonable amount of detail in order to understand where you have incongruencies or where you have a different understanding. Absolutely. And sometimes you could think about functional requirements and take a section and you could walk through and just at a high level talk about them, but then you'd want to make sure that you're you're trying to surface those assumptions that people have in their heads that they don't write down. Because inevitably, on either side, that's where you get stuck. Mm -hmm. So it's all we can tell you, and Don and I had the same reaction to this, which is it's worth the investment. Okay. It, it is worth the investment unless you have an unlimited amount of money for change orders in the future, which I don't believe that's the case for any of us. I don't think I've ever heard that before. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever known anyone who... who pay now or pay that. later. I mean, it, yeah. it's... Right. And you may not be around, in which case it might be make more fun to pay later, but <laughs> your your <laughs> compatriots will. But let's not recommend that officially. Yeah. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not recommending that. I'm recomm <laughs> we're recommending look for the incongruencies. Yeah. Um, Dawn, um, our operator, do we have anybody on the line before I go ahead and wrap us up for the day? I'm showing no questions at this time. Okay, well, I said that we are right at 3.29, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So, again, I really want to thank uh, Don and Cynthia. I know how much uh, work and planning and discussion went into this presentation, and I really do think that it was uh, very valuable, both for the information that you provided, but I also think you raised some, some great topics that we might see in some webinars next year. Um, I think there's you know definitely some areas here where we could spend another 90 minutes talking about them easily. So thank you both so much um, for the, the time and the work that you put into this. It was really a wonderful and educational session for our audience. Um, I hope that all of you who have attended the webinar have found this information to be informative and valuable as you move forward with your CWIS initiatives. If you have any questions or you'd like any more information, I do um, have the email address posted on this slide. And we did record this webinar as we have with all of our prior webinars. Um, so as, as we record those and get them posted to the CB website, you can go back and um, have a look at them. I want to thank you all for attending, and please watch for information for our August webinar via the SACWIS and the Tribal um, listservs. So thank you all for your participation today.